Welcome everybody, in this video we're going to be talking about CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And if you think we're going to be talking about Mediator, uh, we're not going to be uh, on the opposite. We're going to be talking about the damage that Mediator has potentially done to the community of understanding what CQRS is. So today we're going to uh, basically throw out Mediator and we're going to take a look at what CQRS is. A little bit closer we're not going to be talking about benefits or anything like that we'll specifically look at the implementation and what that looks like so everybody who knows mediator this is the secure rest pattern that people are familiar with so you will have a bunch of requests uh, hitting your api and depending on which route it is so if you hit on like get or you want to list some entities generally what you will do is mediator is this layer right here which will basically say oh, okay you're hitting slash i want to query a bunch of things uh, or if you're hitting slash entity, right, I'm still going to want to query a bunch of things. And if we go to the database, we're working with a specific model. And, uh, you know, then the query does something to return a uh, view model. Okay. If you're hitting post, put, delete, this is where these are going to go into the command. And the command is still going to have to work with the same model. And then it's going to go into the database and, you know, do its updates. The fact that you're working with the same model for commands and queries is already not CQRS and uh, Mediator in that sense, all it did is kind of just allow you to logically separate queries and commands. Mediator is more about code organization rather than CQRS. If you forget about CQRS, what Mediator is, you have tons of handlers. All of those handlers are triggered by specific request objects. You send a request object, correct handler gets triggered, and that's it. It's just code organization. The fact that you've logically organized it, right, the way that I'm going to name my classes are going to be, some of them are going to be queries and some of them are going to be commands. That doesn't mean CQRS just yet. So uh, what is CQRS? What does it look like? Let's go ahead and take a look at this. One is hiding behind my head, but yeah, just know that this is a database here behind me. In this scenario, more or less the same thing can happen where you can have a bunch of requests hitting the API and well, again, if we hit slash, we go to query. But however, now we do not go to our main database over here. What we do is we go to this cache layer. It can be elastic store. It can be Redis. Uh, the point is that the thing that you're going to display that is already pre-compiled. It is sitting right there ready to be displayed. And that is what you want to send. Now, when you hit slash post or something like that, and again, put or delete, this is where these are going to be routed to your command. So again, we, we still have that logical separation, which mediator gives you. However, now there is a reason behind this logical separation rather than just sorting a code organizational issue. Here we're basically saying, okay, we have the command. All it does is really writes to this sort of master database, but also there is this event that gets fired off and this can be part of the same API. This is the way that I implemented in this example that we're going to go over, but this can also be its sort of separate thing. It can be a process over here where an event may be fired from a database and then recompile it for the view store, or this can be an event, you know, sent by the end of the command. If we have actually managed to write to the database, go ahead and emit an event. And that's the main difference. So again, commands, if we're writing to the database, we are working with our main model. This is the way that our domain is modeled in. And this is our view models, right? So this doesn't know anything about this, right? So the interaction between queries and commands is completely cut off. And it, only this process kind of knows how to transfer one to the other one or push it from one to the other one. The query side of the API, all it knows how to do is how to go to this view store and access some kind of relevant indexed document. And on the surface level, uh, that is pretty much all there is to CQRS and uh, uh, most of the complexity may lie in the implementation details. So today we're going to look at simple example where first it's going to be your almost there. We have a shared project where really simple. We just have our models, product and stock and just a DB context. So product can have many stock and then stock has a parent relationship to the product. Super simple. Let's close that. We're going to go into almost, and this is your minimal API. We're using in-memory database. I have all of these running. We register the store and then same kind of thing that you would have in your mediator handler. 
you have your DB context or store or whatever, whatever database you have, you query it and you return it. And that's it for getting individual entity, same thing for updating products. Again, we're targeting the same thing on the root here and here we work with the same model. So this is where, well, we're touching the same model and same thing here if we are, you know, updating some kind of stock. Super simple APIs. These are your mediator handlers. Not much to talk about. If we go to Insomnia here, just an HTTP client to poke at our database. Uh, if we look for everything, nothing's there. If we want to uh, create a product, we can. Now the product is there. If we want to add some stock against it, so send this a couple of times. We're now going to have a product with some stock, right? So this is the kind of interaction you get. The diagram that you've seen, one database, commands are just writing to it and queries are just querying from it. So no real separation. We've just said, get commands, don't write anything and post, post commands, don't query anything. Okay. So with CQRS, what you want to do or what you're aiming for is optimizing the commands for writing and optimizing the querying for querying. Uh, sounds about right. Uh, let's go into better. So we're going to go into program CS here and here we have two additional objects. We have a view store and view store updater. So view store updater is that, uh, let me bring this over here, is this process over here. The view store is this database over here. Okay. Coming back to program, we have these two services and you will see for the getters, what I'm doing is I'm accessing the view store. It is still named store. So that might be a little bit confusing, but then uh, you have the writes and updates where you have the store and updater and every time you do a successful save to the database, then what should really happen, and this is not an entirely correct implementation because I'm just going over an example here, you should have a bundled up transaction, a command which you can send and maybe pop off some kind of like an event. So this is a precursor to event sourcing. But essentially what you want to do is you want to update the view store. Okay. So for each one of these, when we create something or when we do an update at the end, we trigger the updater and we put whatever entity is being updated in there. So the view store itself is super simple. It's just an in memory dictionary. So just document storage. If you're going to be again, using elastic or Redis or whatever else, this is what you're going to be doing. The models here are different. So we're not relying on the main models that are in the shared. So in this store, so this is like our domain representation and this is our view representation. And this is what's stored in the document database. The updater itself acts in an immutable way. So let's say there is a big update that we need to do. Uh, we read from the database and because it's in memory, I don't want to give off the vibe where you have this reference to an object in memory and then you can just sort of go halfway through updating its fields and then somebody does a read and then the other half gets updated. You don't want to run into a situation where your document is half updated. You want to do hard writes where you have your data there, you read it, you update it here. So you have a buffer and then you push that buffer into your document storage. If you have proper document storage, that's what's going to happen. If you're going to implement a memory cache like this, just use records and they're going to limit this for you. Uh, however, if you do have a list, make sure it's an enumerable so you can't actually put anything in there. So you can't mutate a collection. So for example, if I have a product stored at an index, I get a product. And if I need to create a new product, I go ahead, take the product and I need to add a new stock. I go ahead, take the original product and I'm saying, okay, it's still the same product. However, now I want the stocks to include this additional stock. And I just set it to an immutable array so we can't change it. And it just doesn't re-enumerate as an enumerable. With update stock, similar story is happening right here. So not much else to it. Again, uh, these are hard written processes. What you want is data. These calls right here, the events should represent configuration of a mutation that is pinged off to another process. This component right here doesn't matter if it's in the API or if it's a separate service. An event is pinged over there and that event is then going to be handled and it's going to know how to mutate or how to update the view store. And again, the only thing that is sent over here is data. You're not going to be able to send the process like it is in this case over the wire, unless you maybe are using closure, but whatever. So uh, this is the situation here. Let's go ahead and see it work really quickly. So or better, uh, let's go ahead and see. So we don't have anything create a product the product. Yep. Let's create two. 
Uh, I'll add something here. So now we have about yay much. Again, if you want to query a specific one. And maybe a point on performance. You can see here where... Actually, I'm going to run performance metrics at the end, right? So then if we want to update stock again, just to show you that this is happening in the query here, let's say, which one do we want to update? We want to update number one or number two. So let's say we'll update number one with the wowzer. So we do that. We come back here. And again, the view model is updated at the database. That is the in-memory store. We're not touching it here. We are actually querying from the view store. So this is one way to do it. You are able to take this a little bit further. Let's say my API returns JSON. Uh, I don't want to store objects. How about I just pre-serialize, pre-compile JSON or whatever, right? So this is where you will end up with this kind of solution. So let's close the other ones. Uh, we still have the same thing. So you have the view store and the view store updater. However, the main change now is that view store is an integer to string, right? So integer to JSON string. And then there's a little bit of logic here to make sure that we compile the old result. So for these, I'm doing uh, things a little bit differently. I'm accepting the context because, well, I need to write the JSON rather than return an object, which will then get serialized. So I'm setting the header, I'm getting my service, and I'm saying store all here. And all the code is available, by the way, so just go ahead and grab it. The same thing happens here. Uh, again, for the posts and uh, updates, so if we create content or, or we update content, again, uh, I'm doing this programmatically. You should be firing off an event, ideally, which is essentially a package which contains all the information that you need to mutate the view model. We're going to go into one of these and just see what they do. If we're adding a product, we just go ahead and JSON serialize the product and we assign it there and then we compile all. So compile all just basically says, all right, all of the collections, all of the values that I have, just, you know, string builder it to a JSON array. Okay. Similar spiel for add stock and update, although we already have a product in the database or in the view store. So we get it from there. We deserialize it. We add another view and then we reserialize it. So this is where I'm saying, okay, well, uh, they're not going to be querying product and stock view directly. They're going to be just querying strings. Uh, this is why I don't mind having a mutatable list. So, you know, make those decisions when you need to. But same thing happens in update stock. Query document storage, update it, and then rewrite it. And again, recompile all of the records. Uh, with this approach, again, let's just go ahead and take a look at it. I mean, it works the same way. So pre-seal realized. We're going to take a look at everything. Um, let's create a product. We'll create a couple. Uh, go ahead and add some stock. We'll then get all of them. And this is what you get. Same thing. However, if you know I do not set the header, some other header is going to be returned there. Again, if we want to get a specific record, we can. So uh, really three approaches. One, the almost one is we're just logically separating our code. The queries, they are querying from the database. The commands are writing to the database. However, it doesn't go beyond that. There is no optimization. It's what I would say, it's not real secure as you've just organized your code a little bit more. With the better approach, this is where you're using different models. Essentially, your commands and queries are on the path to being completely separated. At this point, very likely, you will be using two different databases, one for your core data that is constantly being written to, and one for your view layer or query layer that is mostly being read from. With a pre-serialized approach, we take it a little bit further where we basically say, okay, the data that is going to be returned by the queries, let's go ahead and pre-compile it a little bit more. So just from an object model, we are going to turn it into JSON. If it's going to be queried as HTML or XML, or let's say we want optimized JSON where, you know, the objects, you make sure that the properties are in order, you store them in an array and we want to pre-compile it to that optimized model and you're just going to store that JSON. And that pre-compiled model is recreated every time an update event is sent off. So when people talk about eventual consistency, right, this is where it happens. So let me close this again. So eventual consistency, when we talk about eventual consistency, it's this process right here and this process right here. So first, uh, the write is going to happen. And once we know we have committed something to the database, it is then 
the second process that happens that an event gets fired off and it is this time for the event so let's say this line right here takes t amount that is your eventual consistency the time that is required for that process this is the time where these two databases are out of sync this is where if you're doing mediator style secure s you may not understand that well <laughs> i have written my data i have we read from the database after it's been written, where's the eventual consistency? I don't understand what are people talking about. The eventual consistency happens because you have this process in the middle which takes time to update your view stores. But uh, this is pretty much it uh, as a ending note. Let's run a benchmark of almost versus better. So almost is querying the database with entity framework. Better is bringing up the object from memory and JSON serializing it. I did try running better against uh, the pre-compiled one. However, uh, there was basically no difference. They were pretty much identical. I was expecting the pre-compiled version to maybe outpace the JSON serialization. That wasn't the case. Maybe there weren't enough entities there or something like that, but let's go ahead and take a look. Here are the results. So uh, for the better scenario, we have a mean response of 0 0.86 uh, for the in-memory entity framework and by the way uh, let's quickly check this out program cs i am using the as no tracking so just as you know that is the faster version of the in memory database this is generally going to be a lot slower because you're actually going to be sending out a request over the wire to your database but anyway this is 49 uh, this is 0.86 how faster is better than almost we can actually just take this Query right over here, 0.86, I think it was. I don't think that matters too much. Yep, right there. Let's dump that. And that is going to be 57. With a view model cache in place, let's call it that, you get a 56 times performance improvement. Uh, let's say it doesn't come at a free cost. There is a complexity. There's a view store involved. So another database, another infrastructure component that you have to maintain. There is a whole set of commands. If you have a couple of models, you will need to maintain these as well. There's gonna be a bunch of these. It is not gonna be as simple as I'm demonstrating in this example here. There are simple caches that you can do, query from database, that query response, cache it, and then maybe add one component that can bust the cache across your cluster or bust the cache when you do the right. So make sure you take a look at your scenario. You may not specifically need CQRS. Maybe you can get off with a simpler solution. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, as always, leave a like, subscribe. Any questions, leave them in the comment section. Big thank you to my patrons. Uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and check it out. I have new tiers available. Don't forget to join the Discord server and have a good day.